Welcome to the NFL Week 8 Sunday Slate Breakdown. Here at Lineups, I'm your host, Jacob Wayne, joined, as always, by Cody Malstrom and Will Schwartz. We're on a quick recap of last week. Not our best week overall, but, hey, we're going to bounce back. And the bad weeks are going to come. you got to outweigh them with the good ones, and we'll keep it moving. Um, Cody, 0-5, Schwartz, 2-8. and I went 3-3 and with a slight loss, but... Going to keep it rolling. So successful season overall, boys. And we'll do a quick best bet, worst bet section. Um, any recap, any thoughts from last week? Schwartz, I'll let you go first on that one. Yeah, uh, best bet, worst bet. Let's just put, let's take them both from the same game, actually. Let's go with the Bucks Falcons game. I did a split play as my whale of the week. And it, it, uh, the split kind of canceled each other out. For the best play, we're going to go under 38.5 written in the stars, absolute offensive incompetence both ways, and some very nice defensive plays. I mean, there's fluky fumbles, but I don't know if you guys saw that last one from Ritter. Antoine Winfield did an awesome hustle play, chase down, punch that ball out. I mean, that's good fundamental football. But uh, that being said, worst play might be Bucks minus two and a half. I mean, they were given every opportunity to win that game. They They should have lucked into it after the Falcons kept turning it over inside, you know, near the goal line. And they just were not able to capitalize. So if they weren't able to win under those conditions, it just feels like that was a game they were never going to win. So I don't like my play there uh, too much. Good job, Wayne, for being on the other side of that one. Cody, what about you? I mean, I don't have a best bet. I lost everything. Um, I, in fact, even, so that recap is just for this video slate, including primetime. I lost everything too, except Eagles minus uh, one and a half. That was my only win. Um, I'm on a hellacious cold streak and it sucks. I, I got nothing to say. Uh, everything sucked. All right. Well, I'll do, I'll, I'll do my, uh, we'll recap. Uh, my best bet was easily the Ravens minus three. One of my biggest bets of the season so far. And just like never in doubt. I, I planned on, I was watching red zone to start the day and I planned on switching over to the full game, uh, later on, but never got to a point where that was necessary. And, Lamar Jackson looks amazing, like I expected. Um, so that was an easy, sweat-free. Worst bet has to be the Chargers, man, plus five and a half. Um, first of all, the five and a half is just a bad football number, so I probably shouldn't have bet that. But Justin Herbert, man, I, there's something really off with him right now, and he's just not playing good football. And we'll talk about it in our Sunday Night Football breakdown, but a little bit worried about him right now. Um, so curious to see what happens there, but... We'll get back into our week eight games, starting with the New York battle. Schwartz, I'm sure you have a better name for this rivalry than I can think of right now. I'm sure there's a nickname for it that I, I can't think of. But oh, there we got the Jets yeah. at the Giants at MetLife. Schwartz, I know you're really passionate about this game, so I'm going to let you start here. I am, and there's a couple better names. The first one is uh, the New Jersey battle, since neither one of these teams actually is located in New York. So that's a, that's a pretty big distinction. But what we like to call it is the Snoopy Bowl. Uh, it sounds a little bit like Super Bowl and Snoopy, of course, the mascot of MetLife, which is the stadium these two teams share. It was the only shared stadium in the league for some time, and now it's not anymore, but still a big deal. And it happens every preseason, but it only happens once every four years in the regular season. So every Snoopy Bowl is a big deal, and this one is no exception. Huge turning point for both teams. Jets are gaining some playoff momentum without Aaron Rodgers, and the Giants are entering like borderline Caleb territory. So this is an exciting one. Both of them need it bad. It's the, the Giants are listed as the home team, but it's kind of a fake home game uh, and, you know, a fake road game for the Jets. I don't like backing road favorites, but I don't really count this. I mean, the Giants did have the rights to sell tickets to this one as they would a normal home game, but there's going to be a lot of green uh, no matter what. That's just how this goes. So this is going to be my whale of the week, but I'm going to split it. We're going to do two one-unit plays on the same game. One of them is going to be Jets minus two and a half. Giants don't have it on either side of the ball. I don't see how they're going to score on the Jets even a little bit. Uh, whether it's Daniel Jones or Tyrod, the def the offense has been horrible. I mean, the Bills are injured, and they put nine on them. They should have had more. Put 14 on the Commanders. Granted, that was a win because of the defense. I don't care that Saquon's back. The Jets' defense held the Eagles to 14, Bills to 16. They should have done terrible, terrible things to KC, but the Chiefs kept getting bailed out. The defensive front is going to have an absolute field day with the uh, with the Giants offensive line. Andrew Thomas, I think, is going to play, but I don't know if he's going to be 100%. Bryce Huff has been filthy off the edge. Quinn and Williams is Quinn and Williams, one of the best interior D linemen in the league. Love the Jets defense in this spot. That being said, 
Uh, this could get a little fluky. Jets could win by one or two, some weird football math. So we're going to protect ourselves. And th- this could have, this was very close to being a multi-unit play just on the spread for me. But instead, the second unit is going to go towards the Giants team total. I'm very, very confident in the Jets defense to get the job done. I am mostly confident in their offense to find a couple big plays with Brees and Garrett all healthy. But I'm really confident in the Giants under 16 and a half. So we're going to split this one right here. Um, yeah, 16 and a half is not a perfect football number, but it's a semi-relevant one. I mean, it puts you over two touchdowns and, you know, 16 is a semi-relevant number with some weird football math going on. So I am a big fan of both legs of this, whichever way you want to play it. Jets should have a good one, although it's not going to look dominant because their offense is just not set up that way. Cody, do you agree? Yeah, I'm going uh, Jets minus two and a half here. Uh, It's going to be a massive advantage uh, for the defense, especially because they can uh, rush forward and drop back everyone else. Tyrod Taylor, I mean, or Daniel Jones, which I I think Daniel Jones hasn't even cleared for contact yet. It's what's today? Is today Wednesday? We're filming this on Wednesday. Um, Honestly, either or, it it doesn't change my cap whatsoever. Uh, Either of them is going to struggle with the extra coverage. And then on the other end, the Giants' defense, it's just it's absolutely abysmal. Um, it, it's they, they, they generate no pressure, even though they have a high blitz rate. It's going to leave the middle open. Expect a big game out of um, Garrett Wilson just streaking across the middle for Zach Wilson. He can make the easy throw. It's, it, there's just too many advantages for the Jet, or for the Jets here on just honestly defensive loan. Even though the offense like obviously isn't great or anything, it should definitely have enough opportunities to at least cover this uh, right under the football number. Yeah, I actually, I kind of lean Giants here, to be honest with you. And I'm not betting it because I want to see what happens with their offensive line injuries. I uh, would love to see Andrew Thomas back out there at left tackle. But I, the Giants are going to blitz Zach Wilson a ton. And he might be the worst quarterback in the NFL against the blitz. Uh, last season was dead last in PFF passing grade, dead last in completion percentage, third highest turnover worthy play rate against the blitz. And we saw what they just did against Sam Howell. They blitzed him at 63% rate. I, I don't see why they wouldn't have the same approach against Zach Wilson here. And Tyrod Taylor is better at avoiding negative plays than Zach Wilson is, in my opinion. So I think Tyrod Taylor has been pretty good. Um, I, I'm not saying he's a you know top 10 quarterback or anything like that, but he's been efficient. And he, the most important thing is he hasn't made mistakes like Daniel Jones is making. So I, I lean the Giants catching points here. I'm not betting it yet. I want to see what happens with the injuries, but... I'm a little bit curious, too, with the Jets here coming off the bye week, if their momentum can continue. They, I'm not sure that bye week came at a great time for them. They were coming off of the huge win over the Eagles, had, had just gone into Denver and gotten that huge emotional win. They could be a little bit flat coming off the bye week here. So it's Giants are pass for me, plus three, but it's, it's a pass for me overall. Um, Schwartz, any concerns about Zach Wilson against the Blitz like I was talking about? Yeah, that is, and, and that's why we're hedging this a little bit by investing not just in the Jets to succeed, but pretty much just the Giants to fail. Yeah, Zach has shown some step. He's shown a little bit of progress. I think Rodgers has done some good stuff with him, but he's still grading out terribly, and especially against the Blitz. So yeah, I'm a little concerned about this, but they can keep the passing game quick. Hopefully, they can run the football effectively enough to keep, uh, you know, so there's a little respect for the run, and Zach has a little bit of heat off his back uh, with Brees Hall healthy. But yeah, it, it could it could definitely that could definitely be an issue with the health of the Jets' offensive line. I'm, I'm not 100% on that. That's why we're putting in that piece on the Giants team total rather than just the spread. Yeah, fair enough. And, yeah, worth noting, tackle Dwayne Brown and guard Elijah Red Tucker both on IR. Guard Joe Tittman also listed as questionable for this week. So offensive line, offensive line injuries for both teams. Really recommend waiting to see what happens with those before you place a wager here. Let's move on to the Jacksonville Jaguars at the Pittsburgh Steelers and a game that I don't know if most people expected this to be between these two teams with such good records at this point in the year, but they both look like potential playoff squads. Uh, Steelers hosting the Jaguars at four and two Jaguars now five and two off of that Thursday night football win. Um, the, the Jaguars do come in with a little bit of extra rest coming off the Thursday night football game. Schwartz, you're the only person with a play listed in here. So I'm going to let you kick this, this one off. Who do you like to cover this two and a half point spread? Yeah, I don't. I don't like this one. I, I just talked about how I don't like going in on road favorites, but uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go with the Jags here. <laughs> that being said, Steelers are still a total mirage. They're twenty second in net EPA compared to tenth for the Jags. Jags' pasty has been shockingly good. They're sixth by EPA and DVOA. 
that'll make the Steelers completely one dimensional. And while running is probably their stronger dimension, uh, it's not strong enough. It's not strong enough to win a game uh, without any semblance of a pass offense, which the Steelers pedestrian pass offense should be completely taken down by this Jags pass D. Jags are kind of getting into gear a little bit. The numbers don't love them, love them, but things are coming around. Trevor's looking a little bit more comfortable. This is a half unit play. It's not my most comfortable play of the week because I'm not as enamored with this Jags team as I was preseason. And like I said, road favorite in a very tough environment, uh, the field formerly known as Heinz, but two and a half is an excellent football number. So have to give a little bit of respect to the clearly better team there. Yeah, this is another pass for me. I actually lean Steelers. Uh, probably probably a really good teaser piece, and I, I'll probably have them in a teaser uh, by the time we get to Sunday. But, yeah, curious to see what happens with the offensive line injuries again for the Jaguars. Huge deal with Walker, Walker Little. This is questionable. If he doesn't go, that's a big deal against TJ Watt and Alice Highsmith. But these are kind of two teams that I'm looking to fade both of them. I think they're both a little bit lucky to be where they're at record-wise. So, not enough for me to play here. And like you said, Schwartz, the Steelers are not going to be able to run the ball in this game. The Jaguars have an elite run defense, third in the success rate. The Steelers are fourth, or sorry, 24th in the offensive rushing success rate. So they're not going to be able to move the ball that well on early downs. And then, I mean, this offense with Matt Canada is, is hard to watch. And despite that, the Steelers keep finding ways to win these games. Uh, stole some coin for me on, on Sunday with this Rams game. And a game that the Rams really should have had. But the Steelers came back and won. Um, yeah, it's a pass for me overall. If this is three, I'll be pretty tempted to play the Steelers. Cody, any leans from you here? I lean towards the under. Um, at this point in the season, we know exactly what the Steelers are. It's an absolutely horrific offensive unit, uh, coached by the biggest dingus, um, with an OC to his job title. And this defense, I mean, this defensive line, especially, or really just TJ Watt. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing. They're more than capable of exploiting this Jags kind of iffy offensive line. Um, they've dealt with health issues. They're doing a lot better as they're getting healthy, but I still give um, a pretty sizable advantage to the Steelers. They'll disrupt Trevor Lawrence, get the ball out of him quicker. It's just going to create disruptions, at least on the Jags end. And then for this under, I mean, I'm not really too worried about the Steelers offense uh, contending against it. It's more so just having a fear of a pick six or a, a fluke score. Jags, absolutely no uh, successful ground game. 25th in rush EPA, 26th in rush offensive success rate. It's kind of going to make them one-dimensional, and they're going to have to really try and avoid this Steelers defensive line while throwing over the top of them. It's just not a recipe for consistency, so I'll take this uh, no lower than uh, the current uh, 42. Yeah, same 42, 41 and a half across the market there. So, yeah, I like that one. Um, hopefully you got some weather conditions out in Pittsburgh to help that one out too. But like you said, this fluky uh, d- defense, like Steelers see- do seem to be pretty good for at least one a game of a turnover that puts them either in field position, good field position, or creates a touchdown off the turnover. So hopefully that doesn't hurt your under here. But yeah, Steelers have gotten pretty lucky. Um, but I think Mike Tom is a home dog. Difficult to fade him in that spot. All right, we'll move over to an NFC East matchup between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Washington Commanders. Really good game the last time these teams played. Uh, overtime thriller won by the Eagles. Eagles coming off of a massive Sunday night football win over the Dolphins. One of my favorite plays of last week. And they played how I expected. They were the tougher, nastier, more physical team. But coming out of it, I was a little bit concerned about the Jalen Hurts injury situation. He was clearly dealing with something in his left leg. Was wearing a brace on it in the second half. Actually didn't come out of the tunnel at first at halftime. And Marcus Mariota was in the huddle for a second. And then... Hurts ran out and sent Mariota back to the bench, but he, he's a warrior. He's going to play through. I'm not, I'm not not concerned about him missing this game, but the question is, does that limit their offense if they start to tell him not to run as much in an effort to preserve him for later in the season? Now that they're sitting at 6-1, and one, playing a divisional team they've already beaten this year. Schwartz, any thoughts on this game from you? Any spread you like here with the currently at 6.5 points? Yeah, I don't know why I started this broadcast out by saying that I don't like road favorites because there's going to be a bunch of road favorites for me. Uh, this is another one. Eagles are at six and a half. Obviously, don't need to tell you guys that's an incredibly significant football number, so don't hate being on the right side of that. But yeah, the big thing here is that the Commanders' O line is the worst in the league by adjusted sack rate, whereas the Eagles are 20th in blitz rate, but six in pressure rate. That is not going to fly for Washington. They're not going to be able to run any offense. They're not going to be able to. Yeah, they're just not going to be able to do anything against this Philly pass defense. It's seventh in success rate, whereas the Washington passing offense 
is 30th in DVOA. It's 28th in success rate. They're not going to be able to get off the mat. Hertz might be slightly hampered, but we're still talking about one of the best ground-based offenses in the entire league. Uh, you know, offensive line for Philly is always going to be playing well, like literally always ninth and adjusted uh, line yards. Yeah. All good stuff for the Philadelphia Eagles, whether or not Hertz is quite hundred uh, percent. I'd be a little concerned if we were talking about the 49ers here, but this is, it's the Washington commanders. I don't love the road favorite, but so we're going to go a half unit here because it's a big spread on the road, but just on paper and based on what we've seen in the past, this Eagles team should have no problem. I, I love the matchup for their defense. Yeah, I'm gonna be on the I'm gonna be on Washington here. Uh, I'm waiting for this hit seven. I want a seven on the Commanders, but um, I'm just playing the spot, man. And I, I understand the the matchup issues for Washington in this game, but we already saw this matchup be played, and Sam Howell was pretty good against the Eagles defense before. Um, I think the Eagles still have some secondary issues that they're dealing with, a couple of injuries, but hitting the road off of that big Sunday Night Football win, I think this is a tough spot for them, and. Washington has a very good defensive line that can create some issues for the Eagles up front. And Jalen Hurts has been pretty turnover prone this season. He already has more interceptions thrown this year than he did all last season. The Eagles are the better team, no question. But I like to play this type of a spot with a team coming off of a, such a dominant win. And everybody's all over the Eagles this week uh, talking about Super Bowl contender and all that. And I agree, they're one of the best teams in the NFL. But I'm going to look to fade them off of that hype. And... I think Washington can make this a game. Home divisional dog. Uh, all the trends are going to back this one too. So, yeah, I like Washington. Going to wait to see if this hits seven, but I'm fine with the six and a half here. Uh, Cody, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same mindset as you, Wayne. But uh, I'd wait for a seven, obviously, if I had to pick one. I have nothing on this right now. Uh, and it's more so the Eagles' struggles actually kind of geared towards Sam Howell. I mean, Sam Howell's not a world beater. I don't like judging quarterbacks so early into their career. But we're kind of getting a pretty good conviction that Sam Howell is specializing in just really quick outs, quick throws, dump offs, all that. That's kind of what Washington has to gear towards. Their, or have, It's kind of how Washington has had to shift their offense, especially with the lack of like a true go-to receiver or weapons. And that's actually kind of detrimental to an Eagles defense who, I've said this a million times, the big weakness is the spine of their defense, which means they really struggle to contain the middle. So running back dump offs, they, 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 get, they see open fields as soon as they run up. Uh, receivers streaking across the middle because they can't really create se- uh, separation. It's going to keep uh, drives alive for Washington. Now, Washington's offensive line, not the, like, the greatest unit, little slightly above average at best. At least they can slow down the pass rush. They're not obviously going to negate it. So really, really need Howell to hold on to the ball. when he Because, I mean, once we – obviously he's going to get sacked. I mean, <laughs> he's on pace to set the sack record. Um, so if we can avoid kind of like a fluke uh, turnover or detrimental play for us, I think Washington can at least stay within the number. But um, as of now, it's on a play until this potentially hits seven. Yep, I need the seven here too. Uh, that's the big thing, man, is like just have to avoid a fumble six for Philly in this one. And I, I think we're going to be okay on the spread. Um, that being said, I, I could totally see that happening or a Darius like pick six or something like all within the range of outcomes. So I can see it's not hitting, but like I think this is the type of spot that you bet throughout the season and you will be profitable playing it over time. Uh, not necessarily this one's going to be a winner, but I do like Washington in this spot. Schwartz, any counterpoints to what we're saying here? No, you guys actually do make some good points, and this is this is why it's not my single favorite play of the week. It's it's a glorified lean at half a unit. Uh, just spending on the Eagles to win on the margins, do some things right, and just really make things absolutely impossible for the Washington offense. That's the one I I don't even think how is going to be up to the task if they keep it simple personally, but we'll. Uh, We'll see how it goes. Excited to see this one play out. NFC East always a good time. All right, let's move on to the Rams and the Cowboys. These teams played last season. Uh, Dallas went to SoFi and got a 22 to 10 win. Arguably a better version of this Rams team now. Uh, they've had some younger players emerging for them, but yeah, I I, I don't really like laying six and a half points with the Cowboys, um, given their issues with Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott. Like I just that offense isn't doing it for me, but this is a bad matchup for the Rams with their lack of pass protection. Stafford's not exactly fleet of foot at this point in his career, and you get Michael Parsons and the rest of that pass rush bearing down on him could create some issues. So probably a pass for me on the spread. Uh, Cody, is there anything you see in this matchup that you like? Uh, I haven't fired on it yet. Um, 
I am looking at Rams team total under, though. I want to get a little greedy. I want a 20 and a half. I don't want a 19 and a half. It's 19 and a half across the board. Uh, this The Cowboys front four is going to absolutely disrupt everything that the Rams are trying to do. The Rams have one of the worst offense lines in football. And it, getting the ball out of Stafford's hands even faster, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to create problems. Um, Stafford, he kind of more so specializes in really picking apart as Puka and uh, Cooper create separation as two of like the most elite route runners in football. But the issue is, is he won't necessarily have time in the pocket to let that happen. He's kind of going to go force things. And we're kind of going to see more of a vintage Stafford uh, where turnover worthy plays are going to come out uh, in abundance. And then on the other end, the Cowboys, they're not really like an explosive type offense. They're really just going to try and run down your throat, which is going to take time off the clock. Uh, they're going to dominate time of possession. Uh, Rams defense, not all that great. Uh, they, they, they're going to have issues getting the Cowboys off the field. So I'm going to take kind of like a little smaller up to, or down tick in possessions to really factor towards this under. And especially when they get into the red zone to kind of mask the Cowboys struggles, they're going to be allowed to stretch out in coverage because they obviously have less field to work with. And, and the Rams, they have struggled in scoring in the red zone. So honestly, if I could just get three like within here and there, the, the, the under will be sent pretty. Schwartz, do you agree about the the under in this game? Absolutely. I was going to say, Wayne, when you were doing your breakdown, it felt like we like walked the same trail and fate and ended up with a different view because uh, I agreed with everything you said. I just have a play to pull the trigger on. Again, we're going with a half unit. It's not my absolute favorite because I just like this Rams offense, but I do think that it's a terrible matchup for them. They're going to have a tough day. Cowboys offense, I don't buy it even a little bit. I mean, you guys know I'm not a DAC guy. Not the hugest fan of the weapons they have either, and McCarthy's just a joke. So I think the Rams with the, you know, Aaron Donald and friends might have a chance to force Dak to the air. If Dak goes to the air, I don't trust Dak at all. Again, either way, 45 is a pretty big number for this game for one where we've all stated that neither offense is in a particularly great spot. Uh, so I love this one. Uh, not enough to make it a full unit, but it's definitely, if there's a side, it's a side. I would love to get, I'm seeing 45. I don't know if I said the number. I would love to get that, that half point back and get the hook which is part of the reason this is only a half unit. But if there's a side, it's definitely the under. Yeah, I don't mind that play at all. Um, I'll probably look into a little more and might end up telling you there. Let's move over to the NFC North. we got the Minnesota Vikings traveling to face the Green Bay Packers. The Vikings coming off of a massive win on, on Monday Night Football over the 49ers. Huge upset that most people did not see coming, myself included, with a Niners in a teaser that didn't come through for me. Um... But yeah, Jordan Addison looks great. Kirk Cousins played one of his best games of really his Vikings tenure. Uh, I thought he looked awesome in that one. So heading on, on the road in this one, Schwartz, I'll go to you first. Do you see any side that you like in this game? Yeah, I'm going to read my bullet points verbatim. The first bullet point is just no. The second one is the Vikings are the most average team ever, and the Packers are. Then there's a bunch of words you can't say on television. And then, but Lambeau is Lambeau, and I'm not doing this for a divisional game. Basically, I, I think the Packers are I think the Packers are horrible. I, I was on it before the season. The Bears made them look too good. They had a nice comeback, and, and people were a bit too high on them. And they're coming back to earth. They're going to be seen as one of the worst teams in the league by the end of the year, and rightfully so, because they really are. But I'm so wary of buying high on the Vikings after such an impressive win. I mean, that I can't tell you that the Vikings stock will ever be any higher at any point in the season. So buying on them after their biggest win of the year – Going into Lambeau for a divisional game, yeah, I'm, I'm not touching this one. I'm excited for it. I think it's going to be fun. I think the Vikings are going to pick up a nice win, but I am not putting my own money behind it, nor am I recommending that anybody do that. Yeah, I love the Packers, and it's really just a situational play. Um, this Packers team has plenty of issues, but when you look at the spread in this game, it was going to be Packers minus two and a half before that Monday Night Football win, and I don't really feel any differently about the Vikings having watched that game. I think they got... Pretty lucky in a few areas. Brock Purdy turned into Iowa State Brock Purdy at the end of the game. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I still have a lot of issues with both of these teams. But Packers is a home underdog here. I just I think this should be a pick 'em at best, and I really think it should be probably Packers minus two here. I think these teams are pretty even on paper, so give the home field edge to Green Bay, and I think there's value on this number. So I like the Packers in this spot. I think the Vikings defense. Looked all right on Monday Night Football, but still has a lot of issues. And I think Matt LaFleur can coach them to a win here. Jordan Love's been pretty terrible all season. So that's the only thing that gives me some pauses. The Vikings definitely have the quarterback edge here. But 
it's just playing the number and the values on Green Bay after that switch after Monday Night Football. And I'm always going to look to fade the team that won big on prime time in an upset the following week. So give me the Packers as a home underdog in this one. Uh, Cody, any thoughts? I'm not touching this game with a 10-foot pole. Um, I mean, I agree with the situation. It's definitely like the ultimate buy, ho- buy high. No, buy low, sell high <laughs> spot. But man, it, my bigger issue is I just I don't think I can get to the Packers here after what we just saw their offense do against Denver. I mean, if that if that Denver defense isn't giving isn't allowing you to uh, just really run it up on them, then your offense is just broken. And I mean, that's exactly what this offense is right now. Jordan Love isn't doing anything since his quick little hot start. He's playing well well into expectations now. Vikings defense, I mean, still not like a great unit, but they have drastically improved from last year's metrics. I think they're at least still capable of, of rattling him, slowing him down, um, especially with the heavy dose of the blitz. Even though they don't really generate pressure all that much from the blitz, it's still going to be throwing bodies at love. It's going to kind of really scramble him and force him into more turnover-worthy throws. It's going to halt their offense. And then uh, on the Vikings end, I mean, granted, flukes happen. You know, everyone can beat everyone. That's That's literally the rule of the NFL. The margins are so razor thin. And the 49ers wobbled. I mean, losing Trent Williams, arguably one of the best players in football, um, definitely best for his position. Not having Debo out there, it's it didn't like shock me that the Vikings won. Still a little surprising, um, especially how they did it. But man, it's just it's oh man. It's, but I just don't want to buy the Vikings in the spot either. It's I'm not touching this. I don't even have like analysis for this. To be honest, this is so bad. Dude, I, I, you, you have to make some plays throughout the season that make you uncomfortable. And like, I'm certainly not comfortable betting on Jordan Love against the Blitz. Oh, defense, all my cards but... are always uncomfortable. If I'm not feeling uncomfortable, yeah. then I'm not betting the NFL right. The issue is, it's just like, I just don't have a read on this Vikings team anymore. Like, the ground game's non-existent. So they're not, though, then you look at the Packers and you're like, holy crap, they're near dead last in almost all rushing defensive uh, metrics, success rate, DBO, EPA. But now it's like, can Madison really do it? No, like I don't think he can. Like it's he's that god awful. I mean, we went to length of, on him in our uh, Monday night video. So then it's like, okay, now you revert to the pass attack. Now the Packers midfield defending the pass, it's rough. And Kirk Cousins giving us flowers. He's still he's a good quarterback. Um, Jordan Addison has seamlessly transitioned as a go-to target. TJ Hawkinson, though he was kind of banged up here and there. I don't really know his status. I, I'm sure. I think he's going to be able to give it a go. And then really outside of them, what, you got Osborne? It's like they're – so they're kind of hobbled in that department. The Packers can really kind of just like stretch and just really sell out to defend the pass. So they they can sputter the Vikings easily. And then, like I said, on the other end, now you're rattling love. If anything, I should be looking at an under. Screw it. I'm playing an under. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Official play. Screw both of them. We're going for an under. 43. It's already ticking down to 42 and a half in some books. Yeah, we're going under. I just, I, I don't think either offense can generate enough consistency to really give me a scare here. I'm going under. All right, let's move on. Uh, let's get to the Atlanta Falcons at the Tennessee Titans. And speaking of plays that make you uncomfortable, I'm taking the Titans here, man. I bet them at two and a half, going to bet them again at plus three now that it's gotten there. I absolutely love this spot for Mike Rabel's team. Um, coming off a bye week, home underdog against Desmond Ritter. And yeah, we're getting Will Levis as a starter for the Titans this week. Um, which, you know, there are some certainly some thoughts about Will Levis that I'm sure will be shared here shortly. But wait, is that I confirmed? just don't I thought he yeah, was I splitting. This morning. Okay. No, confirmed this morning. Yeah. Um I don't really care who's under center for this team. Their passing attack wasn't really working anyways. Um, the big thing for me is the Falcons are going to be one of the most run-heavy teams in the NFL. The strength of the Titans' defense is against the run. They're third in run defense DVOA, 26th against the pass. Their secondary hasn't been good. But I don't trust Tessimander to take advantage of that on the road here. Um, I like both of these teams preseason. I have money on both of them to win their division. Falcons look a lot more promising than the Titans at this point in time, but it feels like everyone's given up on this Titans team because they traded Kevin Bayard and I love Kevin Bayard, all pro caliber player, but I don't think he's enough to really sway me off of this team. Um, 
I think Derrick Henry is going to be effective here at home. I think they're going to be able to defend the run of the Falcons. And I just think this is value at this number. Uh, I think this game should probably be closer to a pick and I will happily take the plus three on Tennessee in this spot. Schwartz, what do you think? Yeah, I'm hesitant to bet on a team that is starting Will Levis and has the 25th best defensive EPA in the whole league. Granted, like you said, the the specific matchup works out really well with this uh, Falcons team. They have to run the foot. They have to run the football because Desmond Ritter is. I, I don't even think I need to equivocate on it and say might be or is one of. I think Desmond Ritter. We could just say is the worst starter in all of football at this point. Um, non rookie category, I guess we'll say as Cody likes to do. But you know, he's even lower than the rookie grades. He is the yeah. lowest graded quarterback below Bryce. Yep. Yeah. So Desmond Ritter, absolutely horrible. Dude's a nightmare, but. He might be able to move the ball (laughs) against an EPA, uh, the 28th best pass defense by EPA, 29th by success. He's got weapons, man, but I'm not going to invest in him either directly. I'm going to invest tangentially in the Falcons offense and directly in the Falcons defense by going Titans team total under 17 and a half. Falcon, you talk about the Falcons being run heavy. The Titans are going to want to be run heavy as well. Their rush offense EPA is 13th. Their pass offense, EPA is 18th. Rush success rate, pretty similar story. DVOA, similar story. It's just the rushing is a little bit better, and obviously you're going to want to get Derrick Henry going. Falcons run defense, it's actually the best in terms of EPA, 5th in DVOA, 6th in success. You're going to have Will Levis trying to run a one-dimensional air-only offense. I mean, it's just nauseating for me. And Wayne, you, you might be right. The Falcons might struggle enough that they're able to that the titans are able to stay in this one which is why i'm not betting the spread but if the titans cover i do think it's going to be because the falcons couldn't score not because the titans were able to so looking for an ugly one 17 is a pretty good football number so 17 and a half under love that there that might be a unit play that's a full unit play for me uh so we're gonna we're gonna do that we're gonna fade the titans offense while not touching the other side of the football it is down to 16 and a half just just to know um I assume because of the Will Levis news. Would you still play it there? Um, 16 is a much worse football number than 17. I, I think about moving it to a half unit, but this is, I mean, I, I think that double digits is around what you're going to want to expect from this offense in this game. I mean, no shade to Levis. It's, just, it's I mean, a little shade to Levis. I don't think he's particularly good, but it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough spot to make a start uh, when you haven't really been getting any experience yet, so... I mean, it's just this is just not the spot for them. They could hang in this one because the Falcons' offense has been bizarre. Although there's no way they're going to have that kind of fumble luck ever again. So Falcons holding on to the football a little bit more could help their defense stay off the field and could help this prop. But those fumbles were at the ends of drives anyway. So who really knows? But I am definitely, definitely happy to fade the Titans specifically on offense in this one. Yeah, the, the other thing for me is like, well, Lovis might be bad. We know Desmond is bad, so. I just think with that variance, like I, I'm going to take the underdog. Um, and I, I do like that they're coming off the bye week. He's had two weeks to prep and, and be comfortable with being the starter. Um, everybody's going to give up on the Titans scene after Malik Willis was thrown in there against the Ravens. But I mean, that is just a horrible spot for Malik Willis to step into on the, on the earth, on the road. Yeah. In London against that elite Ravens defense. Like I didn't expect him to have much success in that game, but I think with two weeks to prep, the Titans can do enough on offense to pull this game out. And yeah, I love the value here. Cody, any thoughts from you? Yeah, um, I forgot that I did actually kind of take this on the look ahead. I grabbed it late Sunday. I do have under 38. I would honestly play this all the way down to 35. This is going to be <clears throat> this is gonna be an absolute ugly one. Um, I will throw shade at Will Levis. He is horrible. He's one of the most overrated quarterbacks. Uh, He was the most overrated quarterback heading into this draft, and that says a lot because I was pretty low on Anthony Richardson as a a quarterback product. Will Levis, I I guess I should thank him. He's the reason that I made a lot of money on um, under four and a half quarterbacks in the draft um, because I just didn't understand it, that he was even being like, like labeled as a potential pro style quarterback and compared to CJ Stroud. It's, he, he never threw more than two big-time throws in a single game in his college career. Uh, he has the pocket of awareness of a slug. He, it's, it's, I, I just don't see how he's going to consistently move the ball. Now, on the other hand, their defense is more than poised to uh, slow down the Falcons' offense. Um, absolutely great run-stopping unit, and I am not scared of Desmond Ritter whatsoever. In fact, I've already got some tweets in the chamber ready if Will Levis outperforms Desmond Ritter because that's going to be just hilarious for me. 
And then uh, the Falcons, I'm assuming Bijan's going to be okay. Um, I think he was just, what, a little stomach bug. He said he wasn't feeling well, so you got to see him a week later. He'll be healthy. He'll be good to go. But they're running into a Titans run-stopping unit, 11th in rush defense EPA, 12th rush defense success rate, 3rd rush defense DVOA. They don't, they don't blitz. They don't send pressure, so they're really just going to be stacking the second level. I expect small gains, and I don't really think Ritter can consistently um, keep moving the sticks with his arm. It's going to be an absolute defensive slugfest on both ends. And then if the Falcons want to kind of revert to running, um, well, not revert, if they want to continue to keep running against, it's going to be, they're going against another Falcons run-stopping unit who honestly just mirrors all the same metrics, a great run-stopping unit as well. I'm not buying that Will Levis is going to immediately make an, a, consist, a consistent impact with his arm to kind of really give me fear for this uh, total ticket. I have under 38. That number's long gone. I think it's 36 across the board. If you want to keep, if you want to get on it, like I said, I would play no lower than 35, but for a lot smaller. Yeah, that's not, yeah. I, I think you're right about the total. I just, I personally, like my style of betting, I, I hate playing unders and low totals like that just because of the variance of like one defense touchdown or like one broken play, like can really screw it up. Um, I think you're right though. I think it should be a pretty ugly low scoring game, which is why I like getting the points with the home team. Um, Let's move on to the Patriots at the Dolphins. Dolphins coming off the Sunday night football loss. And I'm currently the only one that has a play in the sheet for this game. So I'll just get straight into my cap. I love this spot for the Dolphins. I think last week against the Eagles was a terrible spot for them. I think this team, when they're at home playing in the Miami Heat, they're able to beat up on some really, really bad teams. And they've done it multiple times this season. When they go on the road to face an elite defense like they did last week, that's when I'm going to look to fade them. But now back at home, a spot where Tua has been dominant in his career, 15-5 and five against the spread at home. I love the Dolphins' ability to, to just score a bunch of points against this Patriots defense. Uh, Patriots quietly 23rd in pass defense DVOA. Certainly doesn't help that Christian Gonzalez and Matthew Judon are out right now. They're two best defensive players. Um they were able to hold down this Miami defense, uh, Miami offense when this was played in New England earlier this year. Completely different situation now with those two guys out. The Bills somehow made Mac Jones look good last week. This Patriots offense still ranks dead last in EPA. I'm, I'm not expecting them to put up a big number here, even against the shaky Miami defense. But speaking of that Miami defense, there is a chance we get Jalen Ramsey back this week. Um, his recovery has gone a lot better than expected, and he was at practice last week. Sounds like he maybe could have played in that Sunday Night Football game. They're being cautious with him, but if he is back, even more of a boost to this defense. But I think this is a complete mismatch, and I'm not scared off by the big number here with Miami. I think this will be a blowout. Schwartz, you're a Patriots fan coming in here. They are coming off the win over the Bills. Has your opinion changed on this team at all this season, or do you agree with my line of thinking here? My opinion has changed on this team pretty much every snap this season, although granted those injuries have been a huge part of me going back to my original opinion that our defense was going to be incredibly overrated coming into the year. That being said, no, I'm absolutely not playing this game. It's the Patriots and the Dolphins. It's nine and a half points. There's no way I'm touching a game. It's going to be 86 degrees and rainy with 14 mile an hour winds sweeping in from the northeast, which is, by the way, directly across the field at Hard Rock, the way it's oriented. Granted, I don't know how much wind actually gets into that weird shape, but no, I'm not touching this. The pa- I-, I think the Patriots are still bad, but their defense might be bad enough, might be bad enough to prop us up just a little bit. I mean, we saw it with the Bills. We're able to take what's given to us, uh, and the you know the Dolphins' defense is not a special unit. 28th in pass D success rate, 28th in rush D success rate. Granted, they're seventh in pressure while being 18th in the blitz, so I don't understand how they're so bad defensively when they're able to generate pressure while still dropping guys back. But yeah, their their O line is tops in line yards, second in sack rate, adjusted sack rate. It's just absolutely brutal. We're not going to be able to slow them down even a little bit. I might look into a Dolphins team total. Actually, I don't have that uh, right now, but yeah, I'm I'm not going to touch this line. It's just way too many points for me for an AFC East divisional game. I'm going to let Cody get into his bit while I go and see what the Dolphins team total is. 28 and a half. 28 and a half. Yeah, I I know I'm I'm silently considering it. That's a I mean, obviously 28 is a very very significant football number, so I might just let that I, one sit and live to fight another day. I just I, I don't really understand why you would be in on that but not the Dolphins to cover a nine and a half point spread here. Um, like I, I just said, I think we can. It. I think we can score. 
I don't, man. I, I like. I, I, I think last week said so much more about the state of the Bills' defense with the injuries they're dealing with than anything about Mac Jones. And I'm going to let Cody talk about Mac Jones for a second here. Like, am I wrong for fading him on the road in the spot, Cody? No, but it's not even really necessarily Mac Jones. In fact, he's not really playing a part of my handicap at all. He's just so insignificant. Uh, but more importantly, it's, I think we're kind of going to see Bill try and double down on what he did against the Dolphins in the first place. He's going to try and drop back everyone. He's just going to let the Dolphins consistently move it down the field. And then when they get into the red zone, that's when he's going to really try and lock up. The issue is, is when they get into the red zone, they don't really necessarily do a great job, especially defending it through the air. And I, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I'm with you here. I'm probably going to fire on Dolphins minus nine and a half. Though I think I'm going to wait a little because if it hits a flat nine, I think I'm going to use it as a teaser piece because there's just a lot of teaser options this week. Yep. It's not even like necessarily I don't think like the Dolphins will cover. It's just, I mean, if I can get added security, it's more so helping me with some other plays is why I would do that in a teaser piece. But as a standalone bet, nine and a half, I, I actually really like it because the, I, the consistent thing I think we're going to see here is the Dolphins will consistently be in scoring position if Bill does what he tried to do last time. Which, I mean, it kind of worked. And then if, if you really just take away the long run. But like you said, they were a lot healthier on defense. Now the fact that they're not, if they try and do the same thing, they're going to get burned at a really bad rate. And then on the other end, like I said, I'm just not scared of Mac Jones. That game really didn't like tell me anything about the Patriots offense um, in comparison to what now I kind of have to view the Bills defense. It, yeah, I'm, I'm going Miami nine and a half here. But like I said, I'm going to wait, see if I can use it as a teaser piece. But Miami will be the play. I mean, what I'm asking you guys right now is that even if you – even if that statement, that last game is more of a statement on the Bills' defense than the Pats' offense, which is, I think, extremely fair to say, is this Dolphins' defense, say they don't get Ramsey back or Ramsey's on a pitch count, is this Dolphins' defense materially better than the current state of the Bills' defense? Is You guys yes. think that lowly of the Bills' defense right now? With the Bills' injuries right now, I think I think they're probably in the same category. Um, but it's not even about that, man. It's about Mac Jones going on the road and playing in what apparently weather conditions, which wasn't a part of my cap originally. It doesn't really change my opinion about this game, to be honest. But it's road. It's all, going on the road for, for Mac Jones here. I just – I think he's going to turn the ball over. I think the Dolphins are going to be able to score at will against this banged up Patriots defense. Like, I just – I think the, the Dolphins are going to name their number here. And we've seen it multiple times all season. They beat up on these bad teams, and the Patriots are a bad team. Um Worth noting that Schwartz did bring up the weather. That is a factor. Um, 60 mile an hour winds, apparently, and potentially some rain. Always, always, always go use, uh, go look at the weather for these games before you place your bets because it can have a big impact. Uh, again, not a huge factor in my cap for this one, but there's a great site called NFLweather.com that I use. Um, you can see some forecasts for the games. So definitely recommend doing that before placing your wager. So I'm glad Schwartz brought that up. Um, yeah, it's worth noting that, um, you know, obviously if weather is a factor, running is less of a less of an issue. Pats run defense is better than their past defense, but the Finns are first in rush offense, EPA, success, and DVOA. So they should be the less affected team in the in the inclement weather, which we always like to know. Wind is more important than rain, but they might have both. Uh, that being said, I found a, a number I like slightly more than the team total, over three and a half touchdowns for the Finns. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go official on that, but I think that's if you're looking at the number of 28, I think three and a half touchdowns is a much better way to attack the same concept. Yeah. I, I just think you're getting too fancy, man. I just think we lay the points and move on. Um, but let's get into our next game. You got the Saints at the Colts. Uh, Gardner Minshew should have led the Colts to a win against the Saints last week. Um, they kind of got screwed in that one. It was some late game uh, calls going against them. Saints also had some weird late game variants. That drop by Foster Moreau was keeping me up at night after that Thursday night football game. But <laughs> Moving into this one, um, Cody, any thoughts on the matchup between Derek Carr and Gardner Minshew here? No, I have absolutely nothing on this. Uh, this is a complete stay away from me. I, I, I don't like this this Saints offense. And now you're, we're factoring Derek Carr throwing a little temper tantrum. I, I think his teammates hate him. I, I, I just, I don't know how this guy's still a starting quarterback. Honestly, if it wasn't kind of for that, just really magical possession that they had late in the game, we're talking about Derek Carr throwing up an absolute dud. And as for this Colts, I just don't – I don't have a read on them really anymore. I mean, Gardner Minshew, he's definitely one of the more serviceable backups, if not like one of the best backups in football. But the issue is the more – the backups always get the advantage in their early starts. Then teams get more tape on them, then they can really just shut them down. And this Saints defense is a very, very good unit. I think they're more than capable of um, shutting them down. I'm trying to find a total here. 
Oh, wow. Overstaking a lot of steam, actually. Um, I just I, – the ground game I don't think is going to help out Minshew. They're, they're Taylor and company, they're going to run into a stout defensive line. They they don't pressure they don't blitz they're gonna they're 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 gonna they're, they're gonna be drop back in coverage they're gonna just clog all the passing lanes for Minshew who's still just eh I just I got nothing on this yeah actually it's funny I, I went back and last se- last season I wrote up the Saints as one of my best bets it was like week seventeen I think against the Eagles when Gardner Minshew was starting for the Eagles with Jalen Hurts out and I had the Saints against the spread and that one they pulled off the outright upset held the Eagles to ten points with Gardner Minshew and. The reason being, Gardner's good when you blitz him and when he's playing man coverage and he can make stuff happen. And he's a pretty creative passer. He can use his legs a little bit. But when you force him to sit in the pocket and make decisive throws and throws into tight windows, that's where he really struggles. And that's what the Saints are going to make him do here. The Saints play a ton of zone coverage. Um, they don't rank high in pressure rate, but that's sort of by design. They don't blitz ever. And they're just going to make you make tough throws. And against the same defense last year, he had four turnover-worthy plays and a terrible 36 PFF passing grade. I don't see a ton of success for the Colts offense here, and I, I know Schwartz is going to get into that cap, and I agree with his take on this one. The reason I'm not betting the Saints here is Dennis Allen might be the worst head coach in the NFL, and that's saying a lot with some of these, wor- these bad coaches that we have. Dennis Allen is the worst head coach in NFL history based on against the spread uh, record, and I'm not... I'm not doing it again. I, I bet him against the Jaguars. That team screwed up so many times. They should have won that game. But it's a pass for me. Schwartz, let's see your take. I mean, my take is that Dennis Allen would still be an above-average coach in the AFC West, but we don't have to get into that right now because my Staley and McDaniels hatred can wait until – actually, I don't think we have to talk about either of them in this slate, so that's kind of nice. Anyhow, uh, Colts are a – Awesome. Uh, the Colts show up basically as a different team every single week. One thing I do want to say is to save, show up for a player props video because Gardner Minshew is throwing an interception at some point. But for my main cap here, we're going to go Colts team total under 22 and a half. It's not a beautiful football number, but gives you a little protection against weird football math. The same secondary is filthy. It's one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. I mean, Tyron Matthews is an all-time you know veteran talent. Marshawn Lattimore is playing some good ball. We got my boy Paulson Adebo from Stanford uh, playing some decent football. The Saints' run defense is also good enough that the Colts can't straight up run the ball up to this number. So they're going to have to go through the air. I like Gardner. I really do. But I, I think this number is just inflated by what I consider to be a 1% performance against the Browns. They got lucky in the macro or in the micro not to win that game, but in the macro. This Colts team getting into the high 30s against the Browns is absolutely a 99th percentile outcome. So all in all, it's just going to be one of those situations where you have to fade a team after they're coming off what I would consider a 99th percentile performance. They, getting into the, In the micro, they were very unlucky to lose that game, but in the macro, you're not going to see this Colts team getting up into the high 30s on defenses like the Browns, you know, particularly often. So they should not be viewed as this juggernaut. Nothing... Nothing specific changed that made that game make sense. So it's just, it was another one of those scenarios where I was just sitting with my jaw on the ground wondering how that turned into a freaking shootout. So even with a relatively dead number at 22 and a half, have to fade this this unit against an amazing secondary when they're going to be throwing for most of the game. Uh, yeah, Gardner, love the guy, but this is not his day. Yep, I agree. Uh, I think this, the Colts are going to struggle to score consistently in this game. Um, probably a pass for me overall. I, I do like, the Saints is a teaser piece up to seven and a half. Uh, if you're into that, I think I might end up having them in something. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and pass on betting on Dennis Allen again this week. It, he, he just, he angers me. Uh, Cody, any other thoughts on this one before we move on? Nope. Not touching a leg with 10 foot pole. All right, let's move on to one that I know you like on this slate. Your Houston Texans coming off the bye week. Um, CJ Stroud is absolutely dealing in his rookie season. Going against the other rookie quarterback that everybody is uh, seemingly out on in Bryce Young, uh, number one pick. But both teams coming off the bye week. Texans catching three points on the road here. Really interesting matchup in a lot of ways. But Cody, I'll let you start here. Who do you think covers that three point spread? I grabbed uh, Texas minus three right away. I uh, just wanted to get that key number. It's really going to come down to health here. Um, this Pan- this Panthers secondary, the Panthers defense really has been their very lone 
I don't want to say bright spot, but I really don't have like another word for it. I guess positive thing to say about them. <laughs> um, uh, but the the issue lately for them is their uh, secondary has been absolutely decimated. Now I don't have any confirmation if they're able to give it a go this time, but really it doesn't matter against the Texans offense because they're just going to continue to keep beating teams and moving the ball down the field by these absolute, just quick kind of Georgia type offense where you just get it out to your guy and make, have him make a play in the open field. It kind of really negates uh, coverage because they're just explaining these small little gaps across. And then where this gets really interesting is while the Panthers uh, secondary has been kind of, like I said, their bright spot, their rush defense is absolutely horrible. Now, the Texans' offensive line has been decimated by injuries, and because of that, that has really negated their ground game to practically nothing, which is really unfortunate because I really like Damian Pierce. He's a good running back, good dual threat running back. But when you don't have protection, you're just not able to really get anything going. I mean, the, all the running legs are clogged. Like He's just getting stopped in the backfield. So that's where this kind of gets really interesting now is can a at least somewhat improving health-wise uh, Texans' offensive line now take advantage of this and if they can get a ground game going, I mean, this Texans offense is going to blossom to something really beautiful. It's going to really, really open up uh, kind of more of a downfield threat. And to be honest, I haven't even mentioned Tank Dell yet. Uh, no confirmation for my favorite player in the NFL right now today. That's not a lion. Um, he should be able to give it a go. Uh, it's been two weeks since he got his concussion. Him returning, it's just going to open up this offense even more. It's going to really free up Nico Collins, who's kind of turning into a real go-to target for uh, C.J. Stroud. And then on the other end, it gets a little dicey. The Texans' defense, while they improved, well, maybe not improved, they're kind of playing about the same rate as last year, though they had a, a magical run at the end of the year that kind of really skewed their numbers. They're slightly below average across the board. Um, they don't generate pressure, but they and they don't really blitz. So kind of where this gets interesting now is Bryce Young has folded under pressure. That's no secret. He is just absolutely turned into a pumpkin when he gets blitzed. It's going to get really interesting now as I think this is kind of his first test of kind of just getting to kind of sit in the pocket. We're going to sit in the pocket, see how he's going to do against extra coverage. I think that's what the route the Texans are going to go. They're kind of going to really dare him to beat him with his arm, and that's not really something that we have seen. It's it's enough of a conviction for me to take the Texans in a small number. I'm not – I do have some intention of possibly buying out. Like I said, I'm monitoring um, health news. It's going to be a major factor later this week. But as of now, I'm sticking with Texans minus three. I'm just gonna have. I'm just gonna back the idea of their offense will find more consistent success than the uh, than the Panthers. Yeah, I'm tempted to bet the Panthers here. I'd love for this to be a three and a half, and it, it might get there uh, the way the market's going. But like Cody said, health is going to be a big factor here. We need to see what happens with some of these secondary players. We do know that Jeremy Chin is going to be out for the Panthers. Big deal on that one. But safety Xavier Woods and Von Bill are listed as questionable. And if those guys are out, this is a pass for me because I do think the Texans' passing game is really well coached. But I really like Carolina's defensive coordinator, Jair Rivera. And come off the bye week, I think he's going to have some really good schematic stuff cooked up for uh, C.J. Stroud. And Stroud's been great, but he's still a rookie quarterback, and you're going to see some ups and downs throughout the season. And with two weeks to prep, I expect the Panthers to have some good film on how to handle him. Obviously, Bryce Young has been far uh, worse than him this season, but... Like Cody said, he's going to have time to sit in the pocket in this game for, I mean, really the first time all season, at least one of them. Um, their offensive line is going to be healthier. Guard Austin Corbett is back, which is a big deal for them. So I like I like Carolina catching points here. Would love a three and a half. Going to wait and monitor with the injury news, but I think there's a good chance I'm going to be on Carolina in some fashion here. Uh, Schwartz, anything from you? Uh, no. Well, uh, let me go. Uh, I got one more thing. Uh, one thing that is also interesting, I'm also kind of factoring in that we can kind of give an uptick to um, – the pressure rate from the Texans because this um, this Panthers offensive line, it's it's not good. Uh, granted, like you said, they are getting healthy, but this is going to be one of the weaker offensive lines that the Texans are getting a, are going against. So I am kind of um, ticking up their points a little um, on the defensive front, which really it's going to bring them to around an average unit uh, once they do that. But yeah, like you said, health is going to be a major factor, especially the Panthers secondary. Yep. Schwartz, anything from you? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool. First Bryce Stroud game. It's always fun to see these number one versus number two matchups. Their stories will be linked just inherently forever. And I kind of thought they played in college, but they didn't. Last Bama OSU game was Justin Fields versus Mac. And anyways, 
into into this matchup specifically, the only thing the Texans are particularly good at, which is pass offense, as per all the metrics, is kind of the only thing the Panthers are good at, pass defense. So I lean Texans minus three. I would like two and a half, but the Panthers are way too bad. That the line's not going to move towards them. I just don't love that particular matchup. As as good as Stroud has been, I don't like betting rookies on the road as favorites, even against another rookie. He's not on the road. Yeah, the Texans should be absolutely fine, but this is pretty much a no touch for me. I'm not. Yeah, I'm. I, I I'm leaning Texans, but at the current number, I'm not going to get there. Fair enough. All right, <clears throat> let's get into the Cleveland Browns at the Seattle Seahawks. Browns coming off of the loss. Oh, sorry, the win should have been a loss against the Colts, but um, they're coming off two straight wins. They beat the Niners in a huge upset, and then last week, and now going on the road, traveling to the West Coast to face Seattle. Uh, some injury news to update here for the Browns. It looks like running back Jerome Ford is going to be out this week, which is a huge deal for a team that already lost Nick Chubb. Probably going to see a lot of Kareem Hunt for them this week, which I don't know if that's the best thing for their offense, although Hunt has looked okay recently. Um, but Schwartz, I'll go to you first. How do you feel about the Browns in this road spot, and do you think the Seahawks at current spread of three is a good value play? I'm leaning Hawks minus three, but I'm not going to do it. I don't have enough confidence in the Seattle offense, Cleveland defense matchup to bet Hawks minus three. I'm very hesitant to touch this Browns defense coming off their worst performance of the season. They they had allowed a thousand yards through five games. That's not passing yards. That's total yards. That's just like nauseating to me. Uh, 200.2 or whatever it ended up being yards per game. Like I talked about with the Colts game, that was an absolute 99th percentile outcome for Indy. That was a one percentile and outcome for Cleveland. So I don't want to touch that side of the ball. And obviously touching the full game lines inherently means that side of the ball. So we're going to go with the other side. Browns team total is going to be under 17 and a half in this one. Wayne, you touched on it. The Browns offensive personnel is not healthy and they already have the worst pass offense by EPA and DVOA. Whether we're talking about Deshaun, PJ Walker does not matter. This is, this has been a bad pass offense. Meanwhile, the Seahawks have the best rush D success rate and adjusted line yards, and they're fourth in rushing defensive DVOA. So what does that tell us? We've got a Browns team missing running backs that's not going to be able to run and is going to be forced on the air despite having the worst pass offense in the whole league in a horrible place for offenses to play, which is, you know, Seattle. It's a hor- it's a, it's one of the tougher home field environments uh, for any team in the league. So we're going to specifically fade the Browns offense team total under 17 and a half. Great football number. Hope you guys could still get it. I have it listed as a half unit play, but I just talked myself into a full unit. That's going to, that's going to be one of my favorite plays. Actually. I love that one. Yeah. And s- somewhat of the same vein. Um, yeah. I love, I like Seattle in this spot. I bet them at minus two and a half. I uh, was tweeting it out and telling people to take it before it moved to three. It's at three now. Um, like it a little bit less, but I, I would still take Seattle minus three here. And really, it's it's like Schwartz was saying. I just don't see this Browns offense really producing that much. Seattle's first in run defense success rate. Huge emphasis point for them over the offseason after their run defense was one of the worst in the league last year. And it's worked. Um, and kind of similar deal for the Browns, honestly. They also had one of the worst run defenses in the league last year and also really emphasized it over the offseason. And it's gotten a lot better. The difference to me in this game is I think Gina Smith is – leaps ahead of whoever the Browns are trotting out a quarterback this week, whether it is Deshaun Watson or PJ Walker. Um, and I think Seattle overall is just a much better football team right now. And I think it's been kind of slept on a little bit. They should have beaten the Bengals a couple weeks ago. Uh, they beat the Cardinals last week, despite some turnover issues. But really, I, I think they're going to be able to defend the run against the Browns. And once you get PJ Walker or Deshaun Watson into, into obvious passing situations in this game, I think that's going to be a problem for them. Um, I like Seattle here. Uh, hopefully DK Metcalf plays because that'll help against this elite Browns defense. But even if he doesn't, I think Seattle's a good spot here to cover the spread. Uh, Cody, any thoughts from you? To be honest, even if DK doesn't play, that's just giving JSN just more opportunities. Yeah. And I, I think he's been perfectly fine uh, given him with the little uptick in opportunities. He's a seamless transition. I, I though I guess against the Browns defense for how stout they are, you do want as, as many weapons as you can as, as you can get. Um, especially because we're probably gonna they're probably gonna feature a heavy dose of the pass. Um, if the if it stays close as the number implies. Now this is ticking up to three and a half almost across the board. I got FanDuel as the last minus three right now, at least on legals. Um, man, I just I don't know if I can get there yet. It's I think 
I don't want to say like we're going to see an overreaction um, of what we just saw the Browns defense, especially when you look back how they started the season as like historically one of the most dominant DVO defenses ever since DVO started tracking. It's there's a little too much variance for my liking. Now I do like the Seahawks team. Me and you have talked at length about this um, before the season. We thought they were kind of um, the division leader, all this stuff. They are starting to mold back into it as they got healthy, especially on the offensive line. But honestly, I keep asking myself, is this offensive line like good enough to at least negate the Browns defensive line there and they're the what the pressure that Miles Garrett can do? I don't know. It's just so tough. And then then I start worrying about like now what's gonna happen when Miles Garrett's in Geno Smith's face. Because honestly, it just one turnover against our favor. Um and now the Browns can really just sit on it. Man, I just I, I'm having such such a um, I'm having a hard time getting there. Now I'm not going to bet the Browns in any single capacity. There, this offense is going to be absolutely broken. Um, I just don't know if I can, I just don't know if I've been convinced enough to take the Seahawks yet. Though if I were to do it, it would have to be now because obviously I'm not going to grab a three and a half. I think this is going to be another just um, not a wait and see another pass for me. But if I had to pick a side, I definitely obviously would lean towards that lone three that's still available. Yeah, to clarify, I would not bet minus three and a half in this game. Um, I need the minus three for this to be worth it. But also wanted to say, Geno Smith has been, I think there's a lot of expectation that he was going to fall off after last year, but he's been just as good, if not better. Still leads the NFL in completion percentage over expectation after doing that last year as well. One of the most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, the offensive line did get Charles Cross back last week, which is a big deal for the, the left tackle spot uh, against his Browns pass rush. Miles Garrett's a game wrecker, and he could cause havoc against what is still a pretty banged up Seattle offensive line. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust Seattle's coaching to overcome that issue and pull out of here with a win. Um, go ahead. I was literally just like, I was actually, I was going to echo that too. Uh, the, as I was like building this in my head. Uh, at the same time, like Pete Carroll, I mean, he's a wonderful coach. He he's gotten a lot of flack, you know, obviously for the, as he deservingly should be for the Super Bowl blunder. But uh, the, they're they're more than smart enough to at least kind of they, they can scheme their offensive line to at least keep chipping and throw doubles, and maybe we'll see more uh, running back chips and then kind of just bounce out because not only because not only does that slow down Garrett, now it's really going to be shifting the coverage because they're going to have to respect um, the running back uh, pass catchers out of the backfield. It's just, I, it's just, I, uh, one, I have lost all faith in coaches being able to do the right thing, even if it's Belichick or Harbaugh or anyone. I just, my belief in football coaches is at all time low. I swear, every time I turn on the TV, I'm watching just some stupid new blunder that someone is doing, and it just makes me wonder how these people have their jobs. Now, with that said, I do highly respect Carroll. I think he is smart enough to make the adjustments to slow down um, the focal point on the Browns' defense. I just don't, I just can't use that belief alone to get me to get this three. I'll probably just wait and see. Maybe Browns will in their scripted sets, uh, which a scripted set is usually the first 20 plays for every team. Maybe the Browns scripted set, they'll get a touchdown. I can get the Seahawks at like a dog live number or something. Maybe I'll play that, but as of now, this is a pass for me. Fair enough. All right, let's move on to a game that I'm actually going to. You got the Cincinnati Bengals at the San Francisco 49ers. I can't wait for this game, man. Uh, Joe Burrow, hopefully going to be healthy coming off the bye week going on the road to face this 49ers team that suddenly desperately needs a win uh, after losing to two pretty mediocre teams in the Browns and the, the Vikings. Um, need to regain some footing in the NFC. Bengals, 3-3 three and three start before the bye week. Joe Burrow dealt with that injury. And the hope is that he's healthier coming into this one. Hopefully we see full Joe Burrow here. I think it's just a really fascinating game overall. Currently looking at a spread of 5.5 points. Schwartz, I'll go to you first. Do you think the Niners bounce back with a big win here back at home? Oh, yeah. And I'm honestly excited for you. It's always a special experience to see Joe Burrow play. You get to see, if you're a big fan of secondary play, you get to see some interceptions. I know I did last season when I went to see Bengals Patriots in Foxborough on Christmas Eve. So that's going to be fun as a lover of defensive football. But jokes aside, Bengals at nine are a super interesting game. I think this is a situational piece. <laughs> you won't find a lower point at which you can buy these Niners in a home game. You won't. Not at any point this season. They've lost two consecutive games coming back home against the Bengals team that really hasn't quite found its footing this year, although things have been looking better with Burrow's health turning around. Conversely, Bengals probably should have lost to the Seahawks, so you're selling on the heels of a pretty weird two-game win streak slash 3-1 and one run for Cincy. Yeah, it's a situational piece. We could talk the Niners to death 
But uh, Brock aside, who is genuinely not particularly good, this is one of the most complete teams in the league. I don't know. Do you guys have an update on Debo's health situation going into this week? He's going to be out again. They really did miss him, but McCaffrey was 100%. I don't think there was any... Uh, I don't think there were really any issues with him, and there shouldn't be this week. So Niners should be much more comfortable at home. Five and a half semi-football number. Like, it protects you uh, with that six and obviously gives you the win by a touchdown. This is a relative, relative no-brainer for me. I'm sticking with the Niners. It's a full unit play for me. Yeah, I I do need to know about Trent Williams' status before I have a real lean in this game. Uh it, <laughs> maybe the best offensive lineman in the NFL, despite being 35 years old, he's absolutely fantastic. And Cody and I talked about it before the season. We Cody just mentioned it. We were doing our Seahawks breakdown. Like part of the reason we were fading this Niners team a little bit is because this offensive line is pretty mediocre at best without Trent Williams and Williams is 35. So curious to see how his health recovery goes. I mean, obviously we want to see him out there. He's one of the best at what he does, but um, need to know what his status is before this game, because we saw what happened with him out and Brock Purdy did not look, look like the same quarterback, especially without the best Samuel as well. Um, it's just hard to know what we're going to see from the Bengals coming off the bye week. How healthy is Joe Burrow? That's a big question. And he looked pretty good before going into the bye. This is probably a pass for me overall. Cody, any take from you? No, this is a pass for me as well. Um, Trent Williams, he is the best at his position. That's coming from a Lions fan who has the pleasure of watching Panay Sewell, who is also just an absolute monster at tackle. But like you said, there's just so much injury variance going towards the 49ers. We don't have confirmation on Trent. And you said Debo's out again, you, um, right? He's listed out in this injury report, yeah, I believe so. Okay. And, yeah, the pass attack sorely missed that. I mean, outside of Brandon Ayuk, they don't really have another, another consistent go-to target other than, obviously, Christian McCaffrey from the backfield. But this Bengals team, man, they can their defensive line, they're more than capable of abusing this injury-riddled 49ers offensive line. And, and like we mentioned, especially the interior protection, their guard play is, like, some of the worst in the NFL. Like, they can easily collapse that pocket. Now, I'm not going to be one of the people who overreact on Brock Purdy because that's what everyone loves to do. They just love to crap on people who are turning successful. Um, if you really need any clue about it, just a la Tom Brady. Like, just anyone who's successful, if they have one bad game, I swear people just want to overreact and flip to the other side. Oh, my God, he's a system quarterback. Well, no, duh. Every quarterback is a system quarterback. Just because Brock Purdy's in one of the better systems doesn't mean he's not being hyper-efficient at it. Now we're just seeing what happens when injuries start coming into a factor. When you're under more pressure, anyone's going to struggle. That's just how the NFL works. The issue is, and even though I just defended him, he's going to be facing some more pressure here, especially like if Trent Williams is out again, which I, which as I was looking this up, it's kind of looking like he is going to be trending towards out, which would be an absolutely massive detrimental blow. And not only does it kind of rattle um, uh, Brock Purdy here and disrupts their, what they want to do with their hyper-efficient pass attack because their pass attack is predicated on clean looks. The other issue um, that we have not mentioned is that it disrupts their ground game. I don't care how good you are. You could have prime time Barry Sanders and Emmett Smith back there. If you don't have protection, you're not going to be able to churn out consistent chunks at a time. You're going to be get, you're going to be getting met in the backfield. And once you make contact to the backfield, you're drastically slowed down, and now the defense can really crash down on you. I think this Bengals defense can do enough to at least keep this close, keep this interesting. The only issue is I just have no interest in five and a half. I would probably play this at a six. And then, like you said, uh, coming off a bye. Joe Burrow, you gotta imagine, obviously got healthy, healthier uh, off the bye. Um, as he's been getting healthier, he's been looking a lot more crisp. He's turning into more than just a one read quarterback. Um, 49ers don't they don't blitz like whatsoever, and they pressure around league average. So it's not like Burrow's gonna be under like immense pressure. Um, I think he'll have more than enough time to at least get his receivers to create separation. This uh, 49ers uh, defense has been regressing, especially in rush. So if Joe Mixon can get it going. It's just going to open up the field, really, for Burrow to pick apart as one of the more, more elite quarterbacks, um, especially pinpoint accuracy. I think they have enough offense to get to stay competitive, and their defense will be the nail on the head to kind of really stay within the number. I just like I said, I'm not playing five and a half. I'm going to wait to see if a six pops up. Yeah, I agree with you. Line of thing. I want to push back on the Brock Purdy thing though for a sec. Like I, he's been very efficient, but 
part of what we talked about before the season, Cody, and, and why we, again, like the, the Seahawks is a value in the NFC West is Purdy came in late last season and defenses didn't really have a chance to watch film on him and like figure out how his, what his tendencies were and play style. And like, I do just wonder if defenses are starting to figure him out a little bit. And, you know, obviously this offense is very talented, but if they're missing their star left tackle and they're missing their star wide receiver in Debo Samuel, is pretty enough to elevate them above that situation. And I'm just not sure. And I think when everything's perfect, that's, that's a fair sentiment. I think when everything's perfect, Purdy is more than good enough to help this team win football games. But against the Bengals defense that I still think is really well coached by Luana Rumo, I wonder if he's in the struggle again, uh, despite being back at home here. Schwartz, it looks like you were going to say something like that. Yeah, I wanted to push back the whole time Cody was going in on the whole Brock Purdy bit and how every quarterback's a system quarterback. I mean, we've seen two quarterbacks go to They're not a system quarterback. They're a product of their system. I mean, we see quarterbacks like Justin Herbert, like, fighting their system. But anyways, we're, we'll get... We can have a quarterback debate another time, but as far as Purdy specifically, there's a difference between, you know, being good and then having a bad game and then showing that you can't do a single thing the second it's out of structure. I mean, like like Wayne said, Brock is very physically capable of delivering the throws. He's a precise passer in a lot of ways when he's given the opportunity. He'll take what's given to him, but if something's if, if it's not given to him, he's not going to go get it. He's not going to get out and find guys that are out, you know, outside of his first couple of reads. I don't think that Brock is going to be a guy that can win you games over the long term. I'd love to be wrong. I love seeing I, – I like Brock's story a lot, obviously, and I love this Niners team. But I think he showed that this is even the first, like, tiny hitch of adversity he's had, and he was really ineffective. I mean – there, there's over hating someone who's having success and then there's being over sheltered. And there's very, very, very few quarterbacks that aren't named Joe Burrow who could throw game losing picks on consecutive drives to end the game and not have it be completely thrown in their face all week by the media. So I don't know if anything, I think people aren't reacting enough to Brock Purdy looking kind of bad. I think he was, I think Brock being, you know, considered one of the better quarterbacks in the league to begin with was a huge overreaction. And, and now we're just kind of coming back to reality. So I'd love for this to be, you know, thrown in my face in 10 weeks when the Niners haven't lost another game and Brock's making the Pro Bowl and all that because I wish success for this team. But I don't know. I think Brock's an enormous problem. I, I said all off season that it was a terrible idea for them to go into the season with him as the guy and they needed to find an upgrade. See, I, and I think, they're, I think they needed to. See, I, I see. I this is, where I, this is the issue I have. Why can't people just say that he's just a serviceable quarterback? Like he's I, yeah, not I, bad. He's I think not that's too good. far. Like, I think that's too he, far like, I'm literally looking at PFF right now. Brock Purdy is literally smack dab in the middle. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm just saying. You know, in, that's in, just people, but people need to overreact. And now I got Will saying like he's you're comparing like the same like is Burrow like what like but but heaven forbid heaven forbid you say anything about Mac Jones. Oh my God, he's not that bad. No, he's like he's like literally the second worst non rookie starting quarterback. Like like there's literally you can say good, middle, bad. Purdy is smack dab in the middle. He does exactly what you need him to do. But you do have a point. If you need him to win games, he's not going to be able to probably do that. But in the system that he's in, he's going to play just perfectly well for you to stay uh, winning. And that's what he does. Like that's And that's what I said. He's not like – not every quarterback is, I guess, a system quarterback, but they're a product of their system. Like you don't just bring in a quarterback and just magically just – transform like your offense no like you do what you need him to do and purdy has done a pretty good job at that when healthy and we're also i just love that we're just kind of ignoring i don't know why i'm doing this i just love that we're kind of ignoring how massive of a loss the trent williams thing is uh jared goff take get rid of panay sewell he's shooting down to probably middle of the pack um who else just has a star offensive lineman Hurts. The Cowboys, uh, when, they're de- when they're dealing with injury riddle issues, Dak Passat's going to go slightly above average or probably right down the middle. Like, I, like people just don't, like, realize also how, how massive an impact offensive line is. Like, if you don't have protection, I don't give a crap how good you are. You are going to be under pressure, and you're going to look awful. And that is what is happening with Brock Purdy right and now. And Mac Jones. But, but the, 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 the thing is, right. when I, by the way, right. when I said Schwartz, Brock is a Schwartz, problem. Schwartz, Schwartz, Schwartz. You, 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 you took it too far, man. You took it too, we, were, we were having a very nuanced, very normal conversation about proper. When I said Brock's said they, a problem, I mean for a team that wants to win the Super Bowl. That's all I meant. See, and I, and I don't know that I agree. I don't know that I agree with that. I don't know. I okay, that's it. And that's a if, they, if the whole 49ers don't get absolutely decimated by injuries last year, they're in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Mm-hmm. Probably. They might probably. I mean, that's, that's a very good Eagles game. Eagles team. So apologies. But. Anyhow. Yeah, well, they also had to play right, the fourth string quarterback. We got to move on. Um, 
I, I, I love the, I love the Rams boys. We got to one. All right, let's get into the Chiefs at the Broncos. My beloved Denver Broncos. We are so depressing. Uh, currently catching seven and a half points. The spread has come down a little bit. Open at eight and a half, which I felt like it was a little high. Down to seven and a half, pushing seven some spots actually. Um, Schwartz, you guys talk me into this, man. I think the Broncos are the play, but I don't know if I, if I have the heart to do it. I do at a half unit. But anyways, the reason the number is coming down is because the Broncos are the side this week. They definitely are. They have to be. This is a half unit play because the matchup isn't honestly perfect, but this absolutely has to be done. This, this Chiefs team, man, you have to fade the Chiefs with over a touchdown spread on the road at mile high. These teams just, just played each other, and it was a super ugly one at Arrowhead. Chiefs covered. They didn't cover pretty. I, I had the Broncos covering that. So, you know what? Not going to worry about it. But anyhow, these games are always close. I know we don't love trends, but I think in these divisional matchups, when it's the same team seeing each other, it matters. As bad as the Broncos were last year, they lost by three at Arrowhead, and they lost by six to the Chiefs at mile high. 2021, lost to the Chiefs by four at mile high against a very good Chiefs team. You just absolutely have to fade the Chiefs. And the Broncos are not as bad as their record shows. I'm sorry, Wayne. I know you... <laughs> I know that it's that you're. It's hard to be optimistic about the Broncos in any capacity at this point, but Russ is going to be better than he was last week. Uh, they finished a game, which is, you know, that's not nothing. And one of their bigger issues is, you know, is the pass defense, the, you know, in its current form with some injuries. And I don't think the Chiefs receivers are going to be able to take advantage of it. I mean, I do think the Chiefs are going to win. I, I should rein myself in just a tiny bit. I think Mahomes and Kelsey can basically single-handedly do enough to win this game. But those wide receivers aren't going to, like, torch the Denver Broncos to the extent that it would take for them to cover this big number on the road. I mean, talk about talk about road favorites. I mean, and how I don't love betting them. This is an actual example of the method I'd like to have, taking home underdogs in the division. At, I got it, I got eight, but seven and a half is it's not meaningfully worse. I mean, watch them win by eight, but like uh seven and a half is still a very good number for me. I like that a lot. Here we go, man. Broncos country. Let's ride. Okay, if I had known you'd have the shirt on the whole time, I may not have been on this bet to begin with. But you know what? Let's ride. <laughs> oh man, um, no, I, I I hate this team so much. Um, but yeah, I'm betting the Broncos here. I have to do it, and I hate it. I'm gonna hate it the entire time the game is going on. Although I'll be at this Niners game, so hopefully I won't have to watch too much of it. But the Broncos defense has gotten a lot healthier, which is big. Um, and like you said, Schwartz, some inconsistencies with the Chiefs offense, like. For for a long time in that in that Chargers game, it was twenty four to seventeen, and they just couldn't put the game away, despite the Chargers doing nothing on offense. And I I just think like they don't really have explosive wide receivers right now. I think Charles Kelsey is playing out of his mind, but outside of him, like I just don't think this offense has that much firepower. I think this will be a low scoring divisional game. I think the Broncos hang within the number. I don't think we win, but I mean that'd be cool. I, I wouldn't mind it, but. Cody, are we crazy for backing the Broncos in this game? Um, not necessarily crazy because, you know, I don't mind the number, especially if you're able to catch a seven and a half. Um, but I'm using the Chiefs as a, teaser, as a teaser piece here. I don't see how this offense sputters whatsoever. Now, granted, Mahomes, he has kind of flirted back to his turnover-worthy tendency, as we've seen in years past, um, as compared to last year where they kind of transformed into a more of efficient offense without Tyreek Hill. But this, the Travis Kelsey to Mahomes connection alone should be honestly able to just keep this ball consistently moving down the field. Um, I don't know if Taylor Swift's going to be in attendance. I guess that's a factor we got to consider sometimes because the splits of when she's bro, doing, when really, she's not, is insane. Really? Really? I thought, I'm joking. It's funny. I thought we were going to avoid the Taylor Swift thing, I, and, and it wasn't even Schwartz who brought it up. It was Cody. I was, I was going to say honestly, if she, if I just, I just, I just saw that. I just saw the split um, yesterday. I never knew like how insanely different it is. Getting no, I don't healthier. actually think that's a <laughs> I don't think I don't think that's a factor whatsoever. I think it is more so health, but that was eye opening. And hey, I don't blame him. Ball out in front of your girl. Good. For I will him. say, but in okay. all actuality, this Broncos defense is like the one of the worst in the league, if not the worst. Well, it is thirty second in uh, DVOA. I truly just don't see. I mean, even if the Chiefs kind of want to resort to conservative, which they tend to do when they kind of especially played down, even Pacheco and like the rest of their ground game should easily find success. Like I just. Can't fathom a scenario where the Broncos or the Chiefs like really struggle unless it's Mahomes doing his arm punts or just kind of throwing like into high pressure situations. And then on the other end, I've been like 
I don't want to say I've been bashing like the Chiefs defense. I do. I did think early in the season they were due to regress when they had like really elite metrics going on, and that has happened. They have um, really brought back. Now the Broncos offense, you know, they're playing serviceably well, um, a lot better than last year. Russell Wilson has been kind of stinkily putting together a decent performance. I just don't think in terms of a shootout, which is what this total has implied, this total has shot up from 43 to 46 and a half. That's what I wanted to get, but I just I missed the key number. I just don't think they can play at a consistent rate that what the Chiefs are, offense is going to be allowed to do. Um, the Chiefs secondary, um, that's where they're that's where their bread and butter has been coming. Uh, third and pass defense EPA, second defense success rate, fifth uh, pass DVOA, and really the Broncos like main. I'm assuming they're going to be playing from behind, so they're going to be doing uptick in passing. They're going to be playing kind of right into their hands. It's enough for me to say that the Chiefs are going to win. I just I didn't want to deal with the seven and a half at that time. I was looking at this. Didn't want to get hooked. So yeah, like I said, I brought, I'm putting him in a teaser, one and a half, one, depending where you get it. But I really don't think you guys are crazy for getting the seven, seven and a half. I just think we're gonna kind of, we're gonna see a shootout here. Worth noting, this is going to be our first snow game of the season. It looks like um, looks like a forecast of snow for this game. We'll see, we'll see once once kickoff rolls around. Um, not gonna affect. Wait, me. heavy snow? No, no, doesn't look like it. Oh, I was gonna say, I'll, I'm wait till we get our first snow over. I can hardly wait to teach everyone about that. Greatest playing, great, my favorite bet in all of sports. Yeah, that that that'll, that'll, that'll be fine. Uh, that'll be fine. That's not this game. Doesn't even look like it's like guaranteed snow, but wouldn't change the handicap in any meaningful way. Uh, just be kind of fun. Let's get into our final game now. Going to be the Baltimore Ravens traveling to face the Arizona Cardinals. A uh, nice bird mashup here. Gotta love it. Um, Cardinals catching eight and a half points at home here. Uh, Cody, I'm going to start with you on this one. Do you have a side that you like on this big spread? Um, yeah, in a way I do. Uh, the Ravens are going to be another teaser piece. It's going to be a very teaser heavy week for me. There's just beautiful options um, all across the board. Now, granted, honestly, you could tell me, you, even if you still wanted to play the Ravens at this current number, I'd say go for it. I just, like I said, I always like the added security, and it really helps me uh, piece together some other games that I'm not really entirely sold on their number. But, man, this Ravens team, I loved everything about them, and they really showed it to me um, against the Lions. Now, I'm taking more away from the Ravens than I am from the Lions. Um, but when this team is healthy, you can make a case that this is the best team in the AFC at at minimum competing with the chiefs. Um, I've knocked the bills down. I'm not putting the dolphins up there to me. It's Ravens and chiefs. And I pray to God, that's our AFC championship matchup. That'd be awesome. They are one of the most well-coached units in football, if not the most well-coached unit right now. Um, the offense line's amazing. The defensive line's amazing. The defense as a whole is amazing. And when they really get creative and they, so I was rewatching the game. Now the lions offensive line, one of the best units in football. We can all say that. But when, what really just blew my mind is how much a, a defensive line can scramble an offensive line just by this, just by throwing schemes at them, the, the cross routes, the delayed pressure, like all this. It, like, they are just so insanely well coached. Even if they don't even have to do any of that, I just, they're, they're going to demolish this Cardinals team. The Cardinals are finally regressing back towards the expected mean of what we, uh, uh, what we thought we were going to come in as one of the worst units in football. Even if the Ravens like don't even have to get creative, like they're just going to run this team right off the field. And then on the other end, with with little, literally no pressure whatsoever, Lamar I think is going to put up another MVP type game when he is on. He's one of the best quarterbacks in football. You just it, the 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 dual threat alone is insane. And that's not even like bringing in the creativity that we're starting to see them sprinkle in as they get more in, integrated into their new offensive scheme. One of my favorite things I was watching with the Ravens offense, um, like you're going to see like Lamar take off. And then he's going to stop on a dime because that's going to suck in the defense. And then that just leaves someone wide open across the middle. Now the Lions secondary, you know, nothing to boot. Like that's, that's obviously a clear weakness. The Cardinals secondary is going to make the Lions secondary look like the steel curtain of the Steelers. This Cardinals defense is so incredibly bad. It's it, it, it's so bad that it almost scares me that we're gonna, gonna the Ravens kind of have a tendency to do the same thing as the Chiefs. They play down to their competition. I don't want to see the Ravens get hyper conservative here. 
I want to see Lamar just keep on pouring it on them. And honestly, even if the Ravens do get conservative, they should have no issue at least consistently moving the sticks against this Cardinals team. I'm so out on this Cardinals team. Even if it's on the road, it doesn't scare me whatsoever. This Ravens team is in a position to route them, and I'm actually really, really starting to believe in them. They were one of my first Super Bowl picks. I got them at 25-1, to 1, and I'm absolutely loving that number right now. Yeah, I'm betting the Cardinals here. Um, <laughs> oh, you. And it's it's pretty simple for me, man. I don't disagree with anything you said about the Ravens. I bet on them to win the division. I bet on them to win the Super Bowl. I bet on Lamar to win the MVP. I think all those things are very much in play. But Lamar Jackson is 3-13 and against the spread as a favorite of three-plus points since 2021. It's the worst in the NFL. And like you just said, they play down to their competition. They're coming off of the biggest one of the week. They put a hurting on the Lions. And the beginning of that game was wild, man. They had four consecutive touchdown drives. And at the same time, the Lions had three consecutive three and outs. I mean, it, it was just pure domination from start to finish. And you're like, oh, well, if they, if they beat the Lions by 32, why would they lose? The, why would they only beat the Cardinals by less than eight and a half? But it's the NFL, man. This is how this works. And it's, it's a week-to-week league. And I think the Cardinals are... Not talented, but they're a pretty well-coached team. I like what Jonathan Gannon's doing out there. And I just see this as a spot where the Ravens are going to come out a little bit flat. Coming off that big win, they were just in London a couple of weeks ago. I think they really poured all their preparation into these past two games. And I think they're going to see this as a spot where they can really just kind of coast to a victory. And they're going to be really conservative with their approach. And I just see this as being a low-scoring game that they win like 20-14, to 14, something like that. And somewhere in that range, like, I, I just, I think they're going to come out a little bit flat here. And not to mention, I, I'm not betting this with this in mind, but there is a small chance Kyler Murray comes back this week. I think it'll be next week or the week after. Doesn't seem like it'll be this week. But I would just say that if you're watching this, I mean, it won't matter when people are watching this because we already know by then. But I bet the Cardinals, just in case he comes back, because it's the spread will drop right away. And even if he's out, of this game, I, I just I'm playing the spot, man. This Cardinals team is bad. Everything Cody said is true. I love this Ravens team, but I'm betting against Lamar Jackson as a big favorite, and I think that's where you want to fade this Ravens team. Schwartz, what do you what do you see in this matchup? I love this small I'm, chance, pun intended. By the way, <laughs> what I love this one because I've got I've it's got a this small one. chance, pun intended, about Kyler Murray. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I love this spot because I have a completely different angle from you guys. I mean, I agree with a lot of what both of you are saying. I mean, Lamar and the Ravens offense play down. They have their weird off days. I think I love my Lamar tickets and my Ravens tickets. I've got the same stuff Wayne does. I think we might actually have them together. But um, I think it's almost fair to say Lamar has the highest ceiling of anyone. I mean, I know it sounds a little crazy, but the throwing can be so good and his running is just unparalleled. But anyways, enough about my Lamar praising. The dude's amazing. Does play down to some bad teams sometimes. So we're going to go Cardinals under one and a half touchdowns so that we can fade the Cardinals without relying on Lamar to go, you know, supernova once more. Ravens are second in the league in red zone defense, 23.53%. And they're only behind the Bucks, who just get, got three completely undeserved red zone stops uh, last week. The Cardinals red zone offense is 24th. They score touchdowns at a rate of 47.06%. It's that simple. Even if the Cardinals move it, which they shouldn't, they're not punching it in. You know, whether or not the Ravens offense shows up, this should the, the defense should should travel. This should be a prop that is in play all game long, no matter what. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say is I'm betting a lot of these big home underdogs. We got the Cardinals plus eight and a half, Broncos plus seven and a half, uh, Commanders plus seven once it gets there. And some of these are going to be wrong. And sometimes you're going to bet these, and you're going to look like an idiot because the Ravens could totally come out here and just thrash the Cardinals. They're a far better football team. But these are the types of plays that you make throughout the season, and they end up being profitable in the long run. Um, and I'm very confident in that. So, you know, you're, <laughs> it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be rooting for Josh Dobbs against Lamar Jackson, but I think the Cardinals are the play here. Uh, Cody, any final thoughts on this game? No, not really. And like I said, um, I, I would be perfectly fine, you know, taking the the number like Lamar doesn't cover like blah, blah, blah. But like the, the potential is still there for the blowout. But the fact that there even is a narrative like towards um, them, like playing down to competition, that's more than enough for me to take the security alone for to take the teaser. Now, some people just aren't into teasers and like all that. And like I said, to each their own. But yeah, I'm taking the added security with the teaser. 
Don't mind it. Yeah, it should be a Ravens win. I think it's just going to be a little bit of an ugly one. The Cardinals hang around. And so that'll do it for us. Uh, check out our Sunday night football breakdown. Fortunately, not as good of a game as last week. Last week, we had the Dolphins and Eagles. This week, we had the Chargers and Bears. So not quite, not quite the same color for a matchup, but definitely still some value to be had across the board for game picks and player props. So go check those videos out. Thank you guys for watching this one. Um, please like and subscribe. Helps us out a ton growing the channel. And we hope you guys enjoy this Sunday of football.